Hello, everyone. Wherever in the world you're tuning in from, welcome to today's Concordia Live. My name is Ashley Abier, Concordia's Programming Manager, and I'm pleased to welcome you here today. First off, I find it important to acknowledge and take a moment to reflect on the lives lost to gun violence in the U.S. yesterday, as well as last week. On behalf of all of us here at Concordia, our thoughts and prayers are with the families impacted by these tragedies and to our country's leadership as we work towards solutions. This month, we are honoring women's health. Today, we have partnered with Concordia patron member SiteLife to discuss the important need for transformative healthcare systems to close the gender equity gap. Our expert panelists will share with you the necessary steps SiteLife and others are taking to eliminate corneal blindness and expand access to corneal care to reach those most in need. In case you're new here, a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees are automatically muted upon entry, but we do hope that you'll take advantage of the chat feature to introduce yourself, react to comments in the discussion, and engage throughout the conversation. To ask a question during the Q&A, please utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will do her best to answer all questions at the end of the session. Lastly, this webinar will be recorded and available on Concordia's webpage and YouTube channel post fact. Now, without further ado, I am honored to introduce today's host and Chief Global Officer at SiteLife, Josie Noah. Josie, over to you. Thank you, Ashley and the Concordia team. In honor of Women's Health Month, I'm excited about the opportunity to bring together an esteemed panel like this to discuss the intersection of gender equity and healthcare. While our conversation is focused on improving access to healthcare for women around the world, today also marks the second anniversary of George Floyd's death at the hands of police in Minnesota. Floyd's murder and the racial and social reckoning that it triggered remind us that discrimination and inequitable access to power and resources are at the root of our most pressing global problems. Access to healthcare, like access to justice and to equitable law enforcement, largely depends on arbitrary criteria like the color of your skin, the gender assigned to you at birth, and whether you live in a high income or low income country. I have witnessed these inequities in action from the vantage of my position as Chief Global Officer for SiteLife. SiteLife is a global health organization dedicated to eliminating corneal blindness by saving and restoring sight. While as an organization, we initially focused on treatment, now we emphasize prevention and early treatment of corneal disease, leaving surgical interventions as a last resort. We are committed to bringing access to healthcare to the people who need it most. Over the last decade, SiteLife's commitment has expanded its footprint internationally to South and East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, making investments in health systems to ensure equitable access to care. One of the most powerful revelations of this work is that people lacking access to healthcare, especially eye care, are women and girls. The numbers are not kind. Two thirds of people who are blind in the world are women and 90% of women who are blind live in poverty. This despite the fact that 90% of blindness can be prevented or cured. Numbers and statistics are useful, but I find the most powerful way to bring these issues to focus is by sharing the stories of people living with these inequities. In 2014, I had the opportunity to meet Chand B, who you see here. Chand B is a mom to four children and a smallholder farmer in rural Telangana, India. She suffers from a genetic eye condition that in advanced stages causes blindness and is extremely painful, but is also treatable. 
Because of her loss of vision and pain, Chan B was no longer able to work on her farm. She had to make the unthinkable decision to send her children away because she could no longer care for them. As a mom, I cannot even imagine the pain of leaving my child because of a treatable disability. Chanbi's story has a happy ending. She was able to receive a corneal transplant in 2014 from LV Prasad Eye Institute, was able to reunite with her children and regain her livelihood. Chan B's story didn't need to be a one of triumph after devastation. It should have been unremarkable, and yet it is common. Lack of mobility, lower literacy rates, less access to health information and services, and lack of decision-making autonomy all impact women's ability to access health services. In most societies, women have less control over decision-making about their bodies, resulting in unintended pregnancies, sexually transmitted infections, malnutrition, and depression. Every day, about 830 women die from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. Ensuring access to healthcare where women are centered is key to achieving SDG 5. And that is what we have the opportunity to discuss today. The solutions will require collaboration across the private NGO, government, and funding sectors, and centering health, the health and social workforce, which is overwhelmingly female, in the conversation is critical. With the right resources and technical expertise, we can ensure women like Chan B can receive timely care so that they don't have to make impossible choices. It's a pleasure now to introduce Radha Friedman, who will moderate the session today. Radha is based in Seattle and is the CEO of Radha Friedman Consulting. She is a social impact strategist with over 20 years of experience in gender equality and philanthropy. As the founder and CEO of an advisory firm working to increase gender equality, Radha is on a mission to encourage investing in women and girls especially women and girls of color, women with disabilities, and women who are LGBTQ. Radha has advised some of the largest foundations in the world, including advising the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on their gender equality strategy. And her work has engaged Nobel Prize laureates, including the Dalai Lama and Mary Robinson. Uh, it's a pleasure to turn it over to you, Radha, to moderate the session. Thank you so much, Josie. It's always so fun when somebody reads your bio. <laughs> and I'd love to do that for the other two panelists who are gonna be speaking with us today. Um, we have an incredible group of speakers here. So Faven Nikuria is based in Atlanta and serves as the Senior Advisor on Community Health Systems for Care. Faven leverages her experience as a medical doctor and a public health practitioner in Ethiopia to provide technical leadership for the health system strengthening strategy of CARES global teams. Faven leads the adaptation and application of successful models and best practices for empowering frontline health workers and meaningful community engagement across the humanitarian and development continuum. And we have Racy Muchilwa, based in Nairobi, who serves as the head of Novartis Sub-Saharan Africa, leading Novartis's work across 46 different countries. Since becoming the Sub-Saharan Africa head in 2019, she's led a strategic business transformation, albeit during the COVID-19 pandemic, to integrate three major business divisions under one leadership and navigate a new strategic direction that focuses on patient reach besides the traditional business metrics such as sales. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to one of the world's largest underserved populations, hence their bold aspiration to accelerate access to healthcare and high quality medicines to over 1 billion people in the region. So welcome to all of the panelists today. And as we start the discussion, I think it's important to remember we have learned so much as a global society during these last two years of COVID about the gendered effects of health and how women in marginalized groups are really impacted differently and the wider social context of health. And I think it's much clearer how the issue of gender inequality 
hugely contributes to gender inequity. So I don't think there's any subject that is more important to talk about than this. So I'm going to start with a question for Faven. Faven, how do you think that governments and private organizations can improve community health systems to help close some of these gender gaps we've been talking about? Thank you, Rada, uh, for that kind introduction and for that question. Um, I think to reflect on that point, um, it's good to start from some of the facts, you know, uh, that we know about health and gender. And Josie actually has alluded to this, to the fact that, you know, women account for the majority of health and social workforce around the world. And by WHO estimate, that is actually around 70% of health workforce being women. And the majority of these women are on the front line, delivering health information and care, mostly to women and children at the last mile. And we also know that women frontline health workers, you know, being members of the very community that they serve, they understand the contextual challenge and are uniquely able to bridge, you know, social cultural barriers to deliver health services to vulnerable and socially invisible groups, particularly women and girls. Who would otherwise be left behind from getting the information that they need to protect themselves and, and also their family. So with that in mind, I mean, one of the ways to realize gender equity is really maximizing, you know, community health workers program to look at the wider social context of health and address the barriers and root causes of health inequity and gender inequality. And this includes training and empowering women community health workers to act as advocates and activists to address and support actions on social determinants of health, including gender inequality, gender-based violence, and discriminations. To give some examples uh, from a recent care program, um, uh, community health workers, after conducting home care visits for pregnant women and repeatedly hearing that their clients and patients could not follow their recommendations for facility checkups, mostly due to high costs of transportation and associated fees, the community health workers voiced this need for financial assistance to, pro to pregnant women. And per their recommendation, our program adjusted its approach and started distributing cash vouchers for critical reproductive health services to hundreds of pregnant women in these two provinces in Yemen. So they advocated on behalf of the women that they serve. And the same program was also in Afghanistan, which, as we know, recently underwent a shift in their political and social environment since you know, August last year, right? And female health workers were restricted in their capacity and movement as a result. Despite this, though, they continue providing first aid and psychosocial counseling to gender-based violence survivors, provide critical sexual and reproductive health services, as well as COVID-19 management and response to thousands of, you know, their community members. So really finding ways and overcoming insecurities and restrictions that they were facing in order to serve the women in their community. So I will pause there, but I would really think, you know, female community health workers being the connectors between, you know, health services and the community, mostly those in need and are falling between the cracks from accessing health services. Thank you so much. I think that paints a, a perfect picture of, of their importance and their role as a, as a bridge. Josie, I'm going to throw a question over to you. What do you think are the biggest challenges that women face in accessing quality health care right now? And, and how do you think that the healthcare delivery system can better address gender equality? Thanks, Rada. I think Faven and some of her remarks really touched on, on key issues that, that we see in our work. Um, and, and it comes down to access in terms of, but, but when we talk about access, it's, it's this broad, broad category. Um, it can be about mobility, right? Getting transportation, as Faven called out, um, to, to the nearest health center, which can sometimes be several several kilometers or several hundred kilometers away. Um, and, and women tend to not have the access to mobility or financial resources in underserved communities um, to make, make those distances. Uh, so being able to leverage in-community care 
um, and, and working with community health workers is so, it's so critical because um, it helps them to find that front line of care by people who know them, who understand their realities in their community, and then connect to higher level, secondary, tertiary level care only if they need it. Um, but the, the challenge is currently too at the primary level, there's often siloed expertise in terms of care provision. Um, so the way global health is set up is we focus on, on key disease areas, whether it be malaria or child and maternal health or eye health. All of these areas are really critical, but we have different players training different frontline community health workers to do this work, or sometimes one who's overburdened. Um, and that siloed experience means that also women may have to travel to multiple care providers to be able to get access to their primary care. So really addressing integrated primary care at the community level that creates an easy pathway for women to access care for themselves and their families is such an important piece of addressing gender inequities because women will seek access to primary care if it's close by. So we need to bring it closer and make sure that it's provided by members of the community who they feel comfortable seeking care from. Thank you so much, Josie. I think that that is a, a really important point, the siloed nature of the sector and let's put a pin in that to come back to that because I have a feeling it's going to play into other parts of the conversation. Um, Racy, question for you. What do you think are the biggest barriers to medical accessibility for women over the next few years? And how do you think that cross-sector partnerships can help solve some of those challenges and, and meet some of those barriers? Thank you so much, Radan. And, um... Probably before some of the statistics have already been raised by uh, by by Josie and uh, Feben, but just to paint a picture, a very clear picture. When you look at it, some of the health indicators afflicting women and rights are one in ten girls in Sub-Saharan Africa miss school during period. This is not something that you'd experience in most of the developed countries, but it's a real problem problem for us. So. Period poverty is a reality and we cannot run away from that to start with. Then according to the 2019 report on SDGs, every 100 boys of primary school age out of school, are out of, they're out of school, but from that roughly 125 girls were denied the right to education. This is in Central Asia, roughly 121 Sub-Saharan Africa countries, some countries in Northern Africa and some countries in Western Asia. This has even been made worse with the COVID pandemic. It's a reality. We need to be cognizant of that. Educated women are more likely to marry an educated man, have planned pregnancy, a decent income, ultimately have more access to healthcare, which is not the case for most of the people in the LICs where you see majority of these women in the communities, in the rural area. If you look at it, in some of the cases, over 60% of the population staying in the rural area. What does this mean for women? These are the statistics. So just going back to your question, the way, the way I look at it is there are two biggest barriers that come to mind. Cultural practices and stereotypes. And the other one is low disease awareness. So if you're talking about cultural practices and stereotypes, power distance is a harsh reality. And there's an extremely discriminative way of living in the low and income countries where we find most of the communities are still patriarchal. Good representation within the governments, within the parliaments, within this governing fact, it's critical because other is if there are no people there, then how will that voice for the woman be heard so that then things are changed? to fit what needs to be done at this point in time. I want you to imagine a woman with six children in the village earning less than a dollar a day. And typically that dollar has to be split in so many ways. There's clothing, shelter, and uh, clothing, the basic needs. So you talk about clothing, shelter, and food. So by the time they think about those many other things, those are just details. Those three need to be made fast. So in most cases, you find that healthcare is always postponed. 
low disease awareness, it's encountered everywhere, but mostly in LICs and LMICs. And to put into perspective, in 20, 2008 and roughly 20, 2018 to 2020, we screened as Novartis together with several partners, we screened 80,000 women in Ethiopia, predominantly in the rural areas. We found that 6,000 had hypertension and diabetes and they never knew. Meaning then late medical intervention also results to poor health outcomes. So disease awareness is critical, is a really critical pillar for health system strengthening because it's the first step in disease management. And if that is not done, then we'll be failing. So that means then as multi-sectorial team, we have to come together and see how do we partner towards meeting and managing some of these barriers that we see coming up. And Novartis has been a big player in that also. And I'll be happy to share that as we go along in terms of some of the things we are doing with Site Life. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Racy. I'd love to, to bring this question to all of you um, because you've touched upon it now. And I think we're starting to see the pattern of how this plays out in in an industry and a sector that is very siloed where conversations around certain diseases are happening over here reproductive access is happening over here how can we transition to a more integrated primary health care model that ensures that women's access and gender equity is centered in the conversation It's a question for everyone, so <laughs> I can call on you if that would be helpful. Um, Josie, would you like to begin? Hey, happy happy to to start off. Uh, thank thanks, Rada. I I think the the piece here is that you know we have so many pressing needs, right? There are so many pressing healthcare needs, and um, particularly. When you look at LICs and LMICs, um, per RACI's point, um, and areas that are hardest to reach, so those rural communities um, in particular, there are, are limited resources and um, they have tended to go in specific disease you know, silos. So whether that's HIV AIDS, child and maternal health, certainly eye health is not exempt from that as all. And, and within eye health, disease focus, right? Cataract, diabetic retinopathy, cornea, um, all in individual silos. And um, it has been a very kind of um, historically a very top-down approach where there is a tertiary level care strategy, a secondary, and we need that awareness to, to raise this point. Like we need the awareness to bring patients in. And so it's really considered more of a kind of a disease vertical in terms of what the planning and programming is. Um, and, um, and funders have played a key role in that. And one of the things I think is, is really critical is that as we look at really effective primary care and making sure we're reaching women and, and the most vulnerable communities is flipping that, um, that vertical and really grounding in what is the most effective primary care strategy um, and centering those community health workers at that. Um, it, is, it is really, really critical to be able to, to do that. Community health workers um, are often the ones deploying these individual strategies um, by different funders, by different government agencies, and, um, and yet they have the most holistic picture of what's happening at the community and can raise awareness if they're given the, the technical expertise and resources to do so. Um, and, and that ultimately is all about early detection because early detection for any disease area and primary care are much more affordable than if we have to wait until someone is in an emergency situation and needs to move to the tertiary care facility. Um, so I think that there's a, a big play for one, all of those in the social sector and private sector and, and Novartis is really at the forefront of this, of really focusing efforts at the community level for an integrated care approach across disease areas 
which means that we have to collaborate, not compete, um, and really think what is possible at the community level. Um, and there's been some amazing work done on this by organizations um, around the world. A, a great example is um, WHO Afro put out an ophthalmic primary care um, guide for what ophthalmic nurses in communities and community health workers should be able to provide. I mean, it's really that guidance across disease areas. Now we need to also integrate that with other disease areas, um, but really focusing on that collaboration of what is the primary health care model um, that, that can cut across the areas. Um, and then getting you know, funders and agencies behind really investing in primary care as a focus, um, as opposed to investing solely in disease areas is critical. Thank you, that's great. Um, Faven, anything you would like to, to share about how to integrate better and move away from silos? Yeah, I, I think Josie had touched a lot of, um, you know, the points and the different levels within the system that needs to work together, not, not only within the health system, but, you know, other relevant sectors as well. And I mean, all that requires, you know, a shift from, a, you know, a health system designed around disease and institutions towards a health system that is designed for people, with people, right? And shifting from this disease-centered to client-centered approaches, right? Meeting people where they are with different service outlets and options and alternatives for easier access. And it's important to note and, and, and you know, that this needs collaboration with other sectors outside of the health sector as well, particularly around issues of women and girls empowerment, right? To be able to access those informations and utilize those information and access those services. And, and I think, um, um, Radha, you mentioned the COVID crisis. I mean, the COVID crisis has also shown us that, you know, investment in frontline health workers and community health workers, both in technical and leadership skills, has resulted in localized solutions, as well as sustained access to essential health services, right? Um, in addition to the COVID prevention and management, you know, other essential healthcare services needed to continue during the pandemic. So integrated um, you know, health system strengthening approach can really enable you know, resilient and gender sensitive or gender responsive responses during the emergency, but also applicable you know, beyond the time of crisis, right? So in general, I mean, realizing the full potential of primary health care or community health work programs may require collaboration. And it does actually require collaboration and taking steps to alleviate poverty, you know, improve transportation, as well as strengthening health facilities and tackling social inequalities, you know, embedded into uh, those uh, different elements. Thank you so much. That was perfect and a great runway, Racy. I think to you when, when prompting the issue of collaboration, how we can collaborate better in order to, to create more integrated systems. Are these the same conversations that you're hearing in the private sector about how to ensure that, that gender equality is centered in these conversations? Yes, from the way, the way we look at it as, as a Novartis is, and Feven and Josie have talked about it in terms of the integrated uh, health system. One of the things which I feel that as much as partners would come in and do what we need to do, if the government does not have very good policies that actually support the work we are doing and creating sustainable systems, then becomes mute. And the way I look at it is, the people belong to the government, maybe for lack of a better word, I would I'll say it that way. So as outsiders, quote unquote, we can come in and say, we want to do one, two, three things. If the government doesn't have the right policy to support that, then there's nothing we are doing there. And some, I normally say that you can give free medicine, even a donation. If the health system is not powered and built to support that, then those medicines are going to expire. To, to expire. You need to have people who know how to prescribe that medicine, people who know how to manage the disease areas. And that's where community health workers come in critically. And the fact that a lot of times, if you look at even the ratio of doctors to patients, especially the specialists, you'll see maybe one in 50,000 patients. Is that real? 
it's not. So it's a matter of looking at it. Yes, we're talking about partnerships. The government plays an extremely critical role, making sure that they have policies in place that remove this silo way of working. And sometimes I would say it's a matter of looking at it that if I come and Josie with Feven, we are saying we want to do one to three things. The government knows where their need is. They can always direct us towards that need if they feel that is what needs to be met. Because a lot of times we'll see that we all come and all bunch in the same disease area because of the silo of, of working. And maybe that's where also the funds are. So it's a matter of looking at it. How is that balance such that we are meeting the need on the ground based on what Feven is saying it's, it's, it's the people. We should create a healthcare system for the people, not for us to take a box somewhere. So it's something we really need to work very closely across all the stakeholders. The government driving a lot of these discussions definitely because they're the ones who have on it sustainably. Because once the donors go, it has to be sustainable. Otherwise then we are not doing good business for the patients. Yeah. Those are all so many critically important points. I was writing down all of these notes because there's so much packed in there that, that goes to how collaboration happens effectively that, that you each touched on. The importance of early detection and talking with one another to make things more affordable, shifting from a business-centered approach to a client-centered approach, and the need for governments to be involved in these conversations about collaboration. And I, I wonder, as each of you are deeply embedded in this work, what are some of the most promising innovations um, in primary healthcare that could help assist in closing some of these gender gaps? What are you finding exciting or innovative that you're seeing others do right now? Um, Faven, this time I'll start with you. I should try to remember to unmute. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Um, I mean, primary healthcare, you know, entails different interrelated components, right? I mean, one of it being integrated healthcare as or services, as we were mentioning, that really embraces, you know, um, public health or primary care as a, a key public health goods and functions, right? And also multi-sectoral collaborations and policies. And most importantly, and the third component is really engaging and empowering individuals families and communities, right, for increased, increased social inclusion, participation, as well as enhanced self-care and, and resilience in health in general, which really determines how those services, um, you know, and information are utilized. And one of the, you know, the approach, you know, towards gender equality, um, um, you know, in our programming care is really, you know, to design a community-driven and, and, you know, a community-driven process that is based on reflective dialogue to build consciousness of existing inequalities, right? And also like, you know, gendered social norms that most of it is not visible and is not surfaced in our day-to-day -day conversations. So really being intentional about having those conversations and reflections and also building skills for, you know, collective actions to challenge and change inequitable norms and, and power dynamics. And we know that, you know, that is not like a one-off training. We can't do that with, you know, one week gender training and, you know, certify and have people, you know, go out and do the job. So we really should be designing our programs very intentionally so that people, and by that, I mean, pro starting from our own program staff, healthcare workers to really reflect on, you know, our gender attitudes, biases and values which, you know, for, you know, one way or another, especially for when circling back, you know, with, for community health workers, for example, they are members of the community. They share those values. They share those, um, you know, gender related uh, practices and biases. So their comfort to be able to address and challenge and change some of those gender norms is, um, you know, should be um, supported through those trainings, through those reflection and uh, practices. So I would say starting from our program staffs and working with, you know, healthcare workers to be able to reflect and address their own biases, to be able to be change agents, you know, to, with the community that they serve is really one exciting, um, you know, approach that we have. And we have seen, you know, a lot of initiatives and, you know, motives, of, you know, as a result of their own understanding 
of how gender inequality is you know very much linked into with poor health outcomes right so that realization that consciousness raising and then the ability to be able to challenge and change and facilitate those processes really um you know initiates those sustainable processes um, of change uh, within those services thank you that is that was excellent um josie what are some innovations that are exciting that you're starting to see in the field I think something that I'm I'm really excited to see is what feels like a movement towards um, a, a, this isn't in the field I'll get there but just um, collaboration and directed funding so the Biden Harris administration global health worker initiative was recently announced to support funding in this area which is amazing we need it to get funded so it, it can take off but that's really exciting. Also seeing the launch of the Africa Frontline First Initiative um, by former President um, Ellen Johnson Sharleaf um, and a collaborative network, which I know both CARE and Site Life are allies, um, ally members of um, the Community Health Impact Coalition, really driving um, work in the sector to put community health workers at the front. So that's kind of collaboration, funding, how do we really put a, a heavy emphasis on primary care? Um, and, and in addition to the work that, that Faven was talking about, that community design, which is core to what we do at SiteLife with our work in community health as well. Um, I'm also excited about the innovations that are, are coming down the line um, with, with technology, um, the ability to leverage AI for early detection and diagnosis, um, telemedicine, and portals like Vula Mobile who are able to really um, help bridge the gap so people no longer have to travel to get more, um, uh, you know, more specialized care, but that can be facilitated by a primary health care worker. Um, so those pieces I'm really excited to layer in to the incredible work that's already being done in the field. That's wonderful. Great. And, and Racy, are there exciting innovations or things that are really giving you hope that you find innovative right now? Uh, yes, I'll mention three. And um, from an Avati's perspective, just building on what Feven and Josie have talked about, because we, we have what we call the Healthy Family Program. And in this case, then we are, we are seeing how can you have community programs with a healthy family in mind? Because at the end of the day, that's what you want to ensure that the families on the ground are, health, are healthy. And we are targeting most of the rural areas. So just being very intentional in some of the metrics, some of the KPAs that you check, that what is the representation of women there? So if you're going for a meeting, how many women do you see? How many men do you see? Can you get more women coming in? How many women have we trained? Let's look at the list. Do we need to train more? Do we need to engage with the village, village uh, elders to see we can get more more women coming in because most of the time they're in the farms. They're the ones who are farming. They're the ones who are taking care of their children. How can we pull them in? Would it would a Sunday be better because then Sunday it's a church day and most of the time maybe they are relaxed. What would that look like? So that is one from an artist perspective, what we're doing. Another thing also which I have seen working very well, which we've also implemented with Innovatis, just delivery of this medicine, where some of the people have to travel from the villages, from rural areas, 400 kilometers away from the main hospital to come and access medicine. Drone delivery. Can medicine be delivered by drones? And it's something that's really coming up. Rwanda is working very well on that. For us, for one of our medicines for sickle cell disease, we've actually been delivering it in Ghana through drones so that then the people in the villages are able to access this. And a lot of times we're going to pick this medicine from this hospital, is the women. So how do we make sure then we're facilitating for them that to serve them that travel? The last thing that I know from a policy perspective, some of the countries, what they're doing, how women can access funds, whereas before then their male counterparts had to sign, had to give approval. Right now, the policy is allowing women to access funds to do something for their families. And I think for me, that is really excellent. And it's a matter of encouraging as many countries as possible to make sure they're empowering women in that aspect for them to get funds to be able to take care of their families in the right way. So those are the three I can mention. Thank you. Those are, those are really wonderful. I love including questions about some of the things that are exciting and that are hopeful and that are innovative because it keeps our eye on how things are moving forward, especially when we're talking about a big topic like 
Sustainable Development Goal 5, which involves half the planet and actually the entire planet. Um, and I wonder if there are some particular examples that can help us illustrate why these innovations are so important in the work that you're doing. And Faven, maybe I'll direct this question to you because you work as a doctor and a public health practitioner in Ethiopia. What does it look like when you're trying to remove some of these gender barriers, especially in marginalized groups and often in places and locations um, that are relatively far away from where health services are located? Yeah, um, it's not easy, <laughs> but doable. So, um, but again, you know, as we were saying, it's really uh, working with the committee that we're trying to serve, not really trying to prescribe or assume, you know, what works and how, you know, it will be taken. Um, you know, just to give an example, um, I remember we were in this um, gender training with local partners in a rural village. Um, and, and, you know, one of the participants, um, uh, apparently a government official came up to the facilitators uh, at one point and asked, why are you in this program against men, right? So, you know, discussing and addressing gender inequality, you know, however we may articulate and understand it or perceive it from our side is completely, you know, there is a different perspective and understanding from, you know, the, the committee side, right? So it really stirs up issues of privilege, right? And threatens power dynamics and the status quo, which, which will be challenged. And not only by the community that we're trying to serve, but also you know, by local partners and program staffs themselves, right? So that's why it's really important for us to, first of all, understand and address you know, the existing um, uh, perceptions, the in existing uh, inequalities and how they are perceived, how they are, you know, um, justified, if you like, or tolerated, um, you know, different forms of gender-based violence. So these are really sensitive issues that we're trying to address, right? And, you know, kind of work through our programs. So really designing for and with the people and taking the time to understand and do our due diligence to really understand and, you know, uh, build our programs and, you know, our implementation based off of that understanding is really, really key. So it's always like, you know, a wake up call for us when we get challenged in such a manner and really be very agile and flexible to adjust as we go, right? There's no one size fits all, you know, approach that we can take towards this. So really, you know, making those adjustments and, and you know, um, uh, doing them as, you know, learning and doing as we go. So yeah, that's what I can add, add to that. Thank you so much. I think that paints a, a really wonderful picture. And Josie, maybe I'll, I'll ask um, a similar question just to paint the picture of, of what some of this looks like when you're actually taking it from theoretical conversations and, and showing what it looks like in real life. What kinds of initiatives is Site Life undertaking to help increase women's access to, to healthcare and to center gender equality? Yeah, a, a huge focus, as I mentioned earlier, was just really looking at how we get into, um, into communities early to prevent progression of corneal disease, uh, because we, we know that over 60%, usually over 60% of transplant recipients in any country um, are male. So we don't think that the disease is that disparate. And if you look at high income countries, it's not. Um, and so really focusing on how we can provide first aid eye care um, in communities through community health workers and, um, and working with community health workers whose remit is typically child and maternal health. So they understand how to work with women in their community and provide add-on care. Um, and even in communities where community health workers have um, sometimes as much of a 30% uh, illiteracy rate among the community health workers, we have seen that they can provide first aid eye care and that their work um, results in a 97% resolution rate for corneal abrasions, which is absolutely remarkable. So it's about training community health workers in their community understanding how the program should be rolled out in that community. So they need to be a part of the design session um, and then continuing to deliver support to the community health workers to serve their own communities. 
Thank you so much. I'm just keeping an eye on time and I wish that we could continue this conversation for another hour, but unfortunately <laughs> we all have to go back out into the field and continue doing this important work. So just to um, give a quick summary of some of the incredible things that we talked about today, um, Josie, you really touched on how gender equality is evident and looking at some of these healthcare issues by just noting the fact that two thirds of the world's blind are women and 90% of those live in poverty where 90% of blindness can be prevented and treated. Um, that really goes to show how the gendered effects of healthcare show up in that way. Um, Haven, we heard from you that, that women are 70% of the, the health force and they are such an important bridge and in terms of barriers between providers and groups that can sometimes be invisibilized, particularly community health workers. And that, that is an issue that touches me very directly because my spouse is alive because of community health workers. Um, and then we also heard, um, Raisi, from you that so many girls in Sub-Saharan Africa miss school because of period poverty as one example of some of the kinds of practices that we need to keep our eye on if we're really going to be addressing equity. Um, so we talked about early detection, making everything more affordable, shifting to a more client-centered approach when we're thinking about collaboration. And you all shared some really, I think, innovative and very hopeful innovations that are starting to happen around empowering women and discussing social norms and collective action that can be taken, collaborative new funding, and better delivery of medicine via exciting new technology like drones. So I think we covered a lot in a short amount of time that is really going to help us move forward. So thank you all. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ashley. Thank you so much, Rada. And thank you to all of our panelists. This was such an interesting discussion. I certainly learned so much. Um, on behalf of Concordia, thank you all so much for joining us today live. Uh, a big shout out to our patron member, Site Life, for hosting today's discussion and for the important work they are doing to transform corneal blindness health systems. If your question wasn't answered today, or if you are interested in learning more about the Concordia membership community, I encourage you to reach out to membership at concordia.net. A follow-up email will be distributed next Wednesday with the recording of today's event and the opportunity to connect with SightLife to continue this discussion and further their mission. We do not want this to be a one-day discussion. Thank you all again and have a great day. Bye.